Good afternoon from sunny Hawaii, Monday, May 23rd, 2022. My name is Howard Wig. Very honored to be your host and very honored to represent the state of Hawaii with the Hawaii State Energy Office because we were the first state to declare a goal of 100% clean energy. And then we've expanded that goal from just electricity to transportation and ultimately to the ultimate decarbonization, where we will be absorbing more carbon than we are producing. Rather ambitious goal. Now, there are many ways to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and certainly maybe the best beloved by all of us is by planting more and more and more forestation so that all those nice leaves can absorb all that carbon from the carbon dioxide which is the blanket that's heating our earth and providing beauty and shade and comfort little um Side story before I introduce our honored guests, I was in El Paso, Texas some years ago. It was winter and the friend I was staying with was on top of a hill that overlooked all of El Paso and then across the Rio Grande at uh, Juarez, Mexico. And something I saw was that a lot of El Paso was green, green, green with trees. And you looked across the river at Juarez and there was this this, this gray brown smudge. And it was the barrio, the slum area of Juarez. And since it was winter, people were heating and they were heating with kerosene lamps in their own homes, causing a heck of a lot of smoke. So there was this big brown smudge and a lot of greenery and red roofs in El Paso. And that gave me one more lesson about the fact that the more trees there are in an urban area, generally speaking, the more prosperous, the more clean, the more desirable, the more valuable everything is, thanks to the presence of trees, which is an excellent segue into my guests, all of whom represent Terraformation, a international a profit company that is aiming to maybe not green the globe, but certainly green as much as possible and absorb as much carbon as possible and cool down the planet in the process, which gives me great pleasure to introduce Mr. Jason Preble. And if you recognize the name Preble, he does come from a distinguished uh, family. And take it away, Jason, Terraformation Hawaii. Oh, hi, everybody. Yeah, my name is Jason Preble. Uh, I'm representing Terraformation with my colleagues, Emily and Christian. Uh, I'm from Kahalu on Oahu. And my background is in biodiversity conservation. So all three of us actually started in plants. And then I did my graduate studies in birds in New Zealand and then bats in Japan. And then coming home to Hawaii, really wanted to figure out, you know, what I could do to help conservation here. And was thinking about community restoration groups and trying to promote those. And started thinking about the bottlenecks that slow down restoration work. And Terraformation, it turns out, is trying to tackle those exact bottlenecks. So very happy to now work for Terraformation. I'll pass it on to uh, Emily. Hi, aloha everyone. Thank you. My name is Emily and I am on a team with Christian and Jason. We're the for, uh, forestry partnerships team and I represent North America and the Pacific, but I'm coming to you today from East Honolulu. Um, I actually grew up on a farm in rural northern Minnesota, um, so I saw my parents work themselves to the bone with very little to show for it. Um, they were more traditional farmers with uh, more rotating crops and using manure fertilizer. And um, they just couldn't keep up with the chemical farmers. So eventually we had to sell the farm. Um, and I always wondered what, you know, 
thinking this can't be right this you know constant battle between um, chemicals and weeds and insects and like what are we doing so um i just remember thinking why are we fighting the natural world like this but still growing up on a farm um fostered my intrigue with the natural world led to me studying um, plant taxonomy and physiology and anatomy and then i became absolutely fascinated with hawaiian ethnobotany um, so that's when i really discovered the deep rich lasting connections between people and plants and i realized that's what I was missing and really what I was longing for that enduring connection. So I ended up getting my um, Bachelor of Science in ethnobotany, and then I got my master's in botany in 2018, both um, at University of Hawaii at Manoa. Mm -hmm. um, well, hard, hard to get much more of a dif difference between northern Minnesota and <laughs> sunny Hawaii. But uh, yes, <laughs> yeah, you, you do make that connection there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess I, what drew me to terraformation was really, um, you know, going back to what I was saying about chemical Western agriculture, it was, you know, why do we need to fight earth on these processes? Um, Earth's been, you know, been successful at these processes for a millennia. So how does earth solve these challenges? And that's really where nature-based solutions come into play. And it's basically looking more closely at how earth solves challenges and then replicating that, whether it's through biomimicry or artificial selection, um, you know, not genetically modifying crops, but um, selecting for certain genetics over long periods of time. And then Velcro, right, is the classic biomimicry example. Mm -hmm. So from school, um, I started coordinating for a lo local nonprofit. That's Hawaii, um, Laukaki, Hawaii's Plant Conservation Network, it's kind of a mouthful. <laughs> um, but the combined weights, I guess, of, you know, climate impacts and island systems. And then I had my second child, our daughter, um, really you know, instilled the urgency in me and the immediate need to do something. Um, so that's how I made the switch from nonprofit over to terraformation, um, because it, you know, using the nature based solutions that sustain and enhance biodiversity, even all while supporting, you know, human well being, that was really the driver and the connection that I needed um, between conservation and climate action. I think I will turn it over to Christian. Hi, Christian. All the way from Puerto Rico. Hi, everybody, and greetings from Puerto Rico. Uh, I'm also glad to be joining this, this excellent team of experts. And we share many similarities, including that I'm also a UH Manoa graduate in botany. So we didn't study together, but we all went through the same school and, and gather a lot of the similar learning approaches that Hawaii has for conservation. And uh, coming from an island in Puerto Rico, uh, I decided to move to Hawaii for almost a third of my career to study and also learn about endangered plants and the rare flora of Hawaii, for which I, uh, I worked with it for about five years while I was working for Fish and Wildlife Service in Honolulu and the Pacific Islands. And through this connection was how I learned about the importance of plants and how key is to use plants as a priority in conservation. Because for example, most animals, all of most animals do use plants. Most animals use forests. And if we don't have a forest, then we don't have animals to protect as well. So uh, I always put plants as a pivotal in, in, in biodiversity conservation. And that's how I created my, my connection. And one day while I'm in the, you know, uh, on, the, on the hunt for a job, I learned about this company, which is doing great things in Hawaii and the reforesting areas on the big island. I learned about that they're tackling some, uh, some of the main bottlenecks in conservation. I myself have been planting trees for almost 15 years, and the main problems that we face in Puerto Rico and in the Caribbean are almost the same as in Hawaii and in many other places in the world, with exception of a few uh, minor things. But we all share this problem of not having enough seats, uh, not having enough trained people, having understaffed, unfunded, and not have enough technology to, to, to scale and fast enough the work that we have to do planting trees. It's not only you know digging a hole and, and planting a, a tree right there, it's the whole process of collecting and, and, and how terraformation is putting all this together from developing apps to uh, working with partners, helping create the projects with partners, helping assess the seeds for, for understanding which one of them can be stored for the long term and use seed banks and nurseries to continuously grow plants and, uh, and protect and help scale projects in the long term. It all starts from a seed, and that's how Terraformation uh, is focusing on. 
focusing on the seeds and we hope to in the future see millions of uh, acres around the world of forest being that's developed. A, that's a great introduction to Terra Formation, Christian. Th thank you. Does anybody want to take the ball from Christian and, and run uh, further and deeper with it? So maybe maybe I'll give some uh, context for the listeners about sure. Terraformation as a company. Mm -hmm. So Terraformation, uh, we were founded by Yishan Wang as our CEO. And starting from around 2017, he was really trying to think about, you know, people are getting more and more worried about climate change. How do we solve this, this you know, existential level uh, problem? And he was so he was going through the numbers, checking out different possible solutions that people have raised for climate change mitigation or solution. And he, he came to the conclusion that reforesting native forests is actually the cheapest and the most political, politically feasible and most scalable solution that we currently have. And it won't fix everything, but if, you, if we could reforest about 3 billion acres of the planet, which is a lot, but is doable, that's the estimated amount that the uh, scientists think is available for this type of work. If we could do that, it would give us the biggest um, sort of runway of time where we could maybe then develop other solutions. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the complete story, but it would be the best way to get carbon drawdown. So, of course, we need to limit our carbon emissions as well as part of the solution, but this would be the most scalable solution for drawdown. So based on that um, conclusion, he founded Terraformation. And in 2019, we started our, our first restoration project on the Big Island. So that's a little bit north of Kauai High on the Big Island is Yishan's property, about 45 acres. And that was the pilot, that is the pilot project for these <coughs> methods that we're building. And so based on that and this analysis of, you know, what are the bottlenecks that Christian touched on that limit restoration work? Terraformation is trying to, as a company, help restoration partners around the world scale up their work. And so the sort of the background that we bring into it is we have a forestry team like ourselves, who our background is all, all trees, conservation, and a lot of NGO work um, and that side of things. And then another big portion of our company has sort of business marketing Silicon Valley roots. And um, that the benefit of the Silicon Valley side or that what, what that kind of background brings to the table is this idea of scaling, right? We hear about it a lot with really big companies out of the valley. And so they're trying to, we're trying to basically scale restoration work, which of course is a completely different animal from like an app or software, but that's what we're trying to tackle. And that's sort of how we operate. Um, I'll pass it on to Emily and she can go into a little bit of those bottlenecks. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, um, really good introduction to the bottlenecks. So <clears throat> like um, Jason and Christian were talking about, we've identified um, major bottlenecks in current restoration, mainly in seed availability, um, tools and equipment, financing, and then in training. So that's why we provide solutions um, in the form of either, um, you know, seed banks or nurseries or small amounts of financing. And then, of course, we have the Terraformation Academy courses in seed banking, um, seed collection, and then nursery management, all online um, for free right now. The major bottleneck though that we noticed in our pro um, projects to date was in seed availability. So while every project is different and unique, that was the one consistent factor. And that's why we took a sharp pivot to address it last year by starting a seed bank program. So we're hoping to establish the world's first decentralized network of seed banks because the current model of seed banking is really geared around rare species uh, conservation. So we wanna get more native seeds into the hands of those doing the work. And you know, seed crops are really variable from year to year. They're dependent on abiotic and biotic factors that we have absolutely no control over. And sometimes seeds just don't set in abundance. And now, you know, we're starting to see the exacerbated effects of climate change, and the outlook is grim at best. The recent IPCC report that just came out says we're going to have more fire, more storms, longer periods of drought. So let's face it, the trees that we see out there today, they might not be there tomorrow. That's why we need to start collecting from every tree we can today, right now, so that we have something for the next generation. Otherwise, what is the next generation going to be planting with? You know, and when you can't find the right amount of seedlings needed from each species to make a complete and resilient forest, when that happens, the restorationist is usually forced to compromise on biodiversity by planting just a handful of species. And compromised forests are incomplete and therefore weak and less resilient to climate's effects. So 
really we're empowering our partners to perfect their supply chain with their own seed bank which will in turn support more restoration projects around the world. So we're not only solving for the dearth of native seeds, but we're hoping that this um, decentralized network is the catalyst for a global restoration movement. That's unmuted. You are, you're the Hawaii contingent and the Puerto Rico contingent of a worldwide uh, effort here. You describe that a little bit. Um, okay, I think I can take that one. So basically, yeah, we started in Hawaii. A lot of our staff, about maybe a fourth to a third of our staff actually is in Hawaii. And then we have other projects worldwide or other, both partners and staff spread out around the world. Thankfully now, you know, we have this option of remote work. Um, and what we figured is if we can do it in Hawaii, which is one of the most expensive places and unfortunately, we have some of the most degraded habitats. Um, so if we could do it here, we figure we can, we can export that process to serve as an example to partners around the world, help them speed up. And so having staff around the world is also helps us get the best talent, but helps us also be a little closer to where our partners might be. So like time zone, we, we, um, everyone in the company is very used to working in a lot of different time zones, and it helps to have people around the world but since the problem is global, we're not just thinking about locally in Hawaii, but the whole world. And then we see Hawaii as sort of um, the laboratory or, or hopefully the leader and uh, an example for other places. Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, I can pass it on to Christian to touch on a little bit why we focus on restoring biodiverse forests rather than just like any old forest, because uh, that's kind of a big issue that terraformation likes to emphasize. Yeah, very important. Thank you, Christian. Yes, so I wanted to highlight also to follow up on your question. One of the reasons I'm based in Puerto Rico is because I'm in, uh, I'm in Latin America technically, and within the working within US, but I have the same time zone and the same language that most of our partners speak in Latin America. So I lead the partnerships for Latin America for, for terraformation. And uh, to, to answer the question, uh, following up on the biodiversity topic, biodiversity. It is defined by the United Nations as all variety of life on earth and natural patterns that it forms. When you plant trees, you're not only planting trees for wood or for fuel or for whatever reason, you're planting trees because the trees bring a value to the ecosystem and they help restore the forest, the trees help restore the understory and, 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 and help a lot of organisms like pollinators survive. So we think about when, when we do our reforestation, uh, forestation projects, we think about biodiversity because uh, we want the, the reforestations to be as diverse as possible. So we can not only focus on the more common species, but not only on the endangered ones to do all of them. And if we can help the, the endangered and the rare species, that would be a great approach for it. And I, I wanted to give you an example in terms of biodiversity and in lack of having access to resources. I live in Puerto Rico where we are very prone to hurricanes and we were hit by not by one, but by two hurricanes in 2017. And while the State Department of Natural Resources and other partners were talking about, let's go to plant trees right after the hurricanes. The hurricane took down a lot of trees, a lot of them still, but they, they, the island is susceptible to hurricanes and a lot of trees above it with them, so they didn't die. They knocked them down, but for two, two years, there were no seats out in the field. There were no access to go out in the field. And when we wanted it to start restoring the, the forest, we had no resources because we don't have a seed bank in Puerto Rico. If we would have had a seed bank in Puerto Rico with diversity of seeds stored in it, we can go right away uh, and restore the forest. This not only happens in, in biodiversity, but also in agriculture. We suffer from the same problem in agriculture. But in terms of, of addressing biodiversity, uh, having a, a, a place where you can store your biodiversity in a genetically, you know, in a, in a genetically approach that you conserve as much as possible in a small space, like in a seed bank, is what we could it could have helped us to restore Puerto Rico's forest back right after the hurricane. It's still, the work is ongoing, and we still have a lot of things that nature does on its own, but we didn't have the opportunity to help speed up the process. And uh, that's one of the things that I wanted to, to mention as a, 
as a comparison, you know, and, and, and something that, that we live through in a, in a life experience. And uh, I wanted to uh, also address the issue of lack of diversity, because right now there was a big study that came up from by, uh, Botanical Garden Conservation International, where they say that one out of uh, three trees are in danger, including Hawaii, which I actually had some numbers in here. Hawaii has about 163 trees and, a hundred, and uh, sorry, 284 trees and 163 are threatened with extinction, according to Matt Keir, who's a state botanist. So that's a big number. And if we look at how much biodiversity is being lost throughout the world through reasons like unsustainable farming, agriculture, development, and many other reasons invasive species, we have to work together and not only address planting trees, we have to plant diverse trees so we can restore ecosystem functions, which are the ones that are absorbing carbon. Not only trees absorb carbon, the entire biodiversity sequesters carbon in a different way. All plants on life use uh, uh, CO2, which is one of the uh, gases emitted by, by the uh, global uh, climate change. And all plants on earth are capable of, of sequestering it. So to a certain degree, they're all important in the restoration process. It's not only the trees, it's all about the forest and the forms of life that are part of it. Now, let me uh, take that into the urban sphere for a minute. One of the areas that I work on is urban heat island effect. And the, there are very, very hot areas of uh, cities and guess what? Those are the areas without trees. So there are at least two organizations here locally whose function it is to get as many trees into as many urban areas as possible. So that, that's just a little uh, sideline from uh, what you folks are doing. Yeah, there's a lot of like carbon is the big sort of the hot topic, um, but there's a lot of other uh, values in forests and the biodiversity mm -hmm. crisis is actually just as major as the carbon crisis in terms of you know the potential damage and potential knock-on effects that we can't predict or have already started to see if anybody listening went to google terraformation you can see on our website um, there's links to some of our sites on the big island and they might give you more and some of our partner sites as well so that'll give you more of an idea of what this work looks like, what our seed banks look like. And basically, we have these seed banks that have solar panels on them so that they can power themselves in the tropics in places that might not have easy access to electricity. And so those seed banks, which can be used to store seed for several years, can then service nurseries where the seeds are grown, which people might be familiar with that, what that looks like. And then those are eventually outplanted and then maintained. So there's, a, there's this uh, focus on tree planting and people might've heard of a lot of tree planting projects, but of course tree planting is not the end of restoration work. And you don't, you don't just put, Christian mentioned this before, but you don't just put a tree in the ground and then you get a forest. Um, you have to make sure that those trees grow up and any issues that you know, arise in that process are taken care of. So it is, it is a long process. Oh yes, this is our, this is our website. Um, it is a long process from seed to carbon or whatever other values you want out of a forest. And there is some, um, you know, we humans think on short terms a lot of the time, but we're tackling a problem like climate change that is massive and is very different from any other problems humans have tackled before. And so there's, we're trying to do our best to remove bottlenecks at every step of this process. And our Big Island, um, our Big Island pilot projects are us you know working through those and then taking our learnings and applying them elsewhere so if folks if folks are interested if you're on the big island for example um you can reach out to us there's there's a email that's tours just the word tours at terraformation.com or you could email me if you have a question just jason at terraformation.com so those two are tours at terraformation.com or jason at terraformation.com and yeah if you're on the big island um, we do take tours. We have a uh, KLE is one of our staff members who does community relations. That's his whole job. Um, and we think that's very important to do, not just in Hawaii, but also all our partner projects, because you need that community support to make sure the trees, you know, become a forest. You don't want people cutting them down. You might lose funding. It's a very long term thing. 
Um, so yeah, I just wanted to put that out there before we run out of time. Very, very good. And we have a couple of minutes, uh, maybe give some examples of what, what's going on on the Big Island. Um, so on the Big Island, we have three sites uh, that are really like putting trees in the ground. Um, we have one site is a little bit about above Kauai High. That's Yishan's property. We call it Pacific Flight. Um, it's along the coast, very, very dry, like two inches of rain a year. So basically a desert, um, unfortunately denuded over a long period of land misuse. And so that project has a desalination plant watering the plants. And then we have a site above Kailua Kona that is we call Future Forest that has a nursery and a seed bank. And then we also have a site uh, a little east of Waimea that's our only wet forest site that's just starting to get, uh, get going. And they also um, have a nursery nearby in Waimea. Wow, that would make for some great uh, ecotourism. <laughs> I, I bet a lot of people visiting Hawaii, they, they just don't want to you know, see the hula dancers or go shopping. They, they want to do something meaningful. <clears throat> well, hopefully if we can build up the, um, the visibility of this type of work, that would be mm -hmm, really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I bet you would get a lot of uh, interested, interested tourists, and maybe they can then spread the word, plant more, more seeds for you. Uh, I, I would strongly encourage that. All of which brings us, unfortunately, to an end to this wonderful program and the wonderful work you folks are doing. Thank you, Jason, Emily, Christian, so much. And I know that everybody watching this wishes you well. And you did get the, uh, the link up there if they want to uh, contact you. So Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you so much again to all you wonderful people and see you next time. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.